So last year, during the Christmas season, my family decided we were going to try and do something a little different. We decided that each night throughout the Christmas season, we were going to watch either a Christmas movie or some Christmas television episode, which led to a lot of interesting discussions uh, every night. Uh, The first discussion would be, what are we going to watch? The second discussion would be, does this count? Does this count as a Christmas movie? Does this count as a Christmas episode or doesn't? So we had to struggle with some of the age-old questions like, is Die Hard really a Christmas movie or not? And then we had to wrestle with the question, is a holiday special a Christmas television episode or is it not? And if a holiday special is a Christmas episode, then would we decide one more time to subject ourselves to one of the worst holiday episodes in the history of mankind, the Star Wars holiday special? I don't know if any of you have ever seen this or not, but if you have not seen it, consider yourself blessed. It is probably not only the worst Christmas episode that's ever been created, it may have been one of the worst movies ever created. In fact, you remember a couple weeks ago, uh, we looked at a question Jesus asked. Jesus asked, can any of you, by worrying, at a single hour to your life? And we all knew the answer was no. However, can any of you, by not watching this episode, gain back an hour of your life? Absolutely. I would definitely encourage you not to expose yourself to that. And now I know you all, you're going to go home and check this out. If you can make it through the whole thing, Props to you, because it, it, takes, it takes some patience. We watched many of the things that you might expect we would watch during a holiday season. It's a Wonderful Life, A Christmas Carol, Charlie Brown Christmas. I know Apple TV is now holding that last one hostage, and some of you are really bitter about that. We own the DVD, so if you want to invite us over for a watch party, we'll have a watch party. We'll do jelly beans, buttered toast, and popcorn like they did in the show, and, and we'll watch that. So we watched some of the ones that you might expect we would watch during the holiday season, but we also watched some that are a little off the beaten path, uh, ones that happen to be our favorites. Uh, this one, Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Tyler and I love it. My wife has to endure it each year, but if you've seen that in the Christmas branch, that is like one of my all-time favorite holiday Christmas movies. Uh, this one's another one. This is way up on my list. Year Without a Santa Claus, the one with Heat Miser and Snow Miser. That one is like way up here for me. Uh, and then there's one that's a little off the beaten path. It's a movie based on a book that maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. Uh, the Best Christmas Pageant Ever. Uh, it's, it's a story about a church Christmas play that goes horribly wrong on one hand and yet perfectly right on the other. And there's a scene in that movie where the director of the play is teaching the children the Christmas story, and she says that Mary was pregnant. And one of the girls in the movie gets horribly offended by that statement because she's only learned the King James version of that, which is Mary was great with child. And Mary being great with child sounds far more reverent, so much more godly, so much more respectful than Mary being pregnant. Pregnant just sounded too earthy. For this girl. Scripture translate this section of scripture in a number of different ways. Mary was with child. Mary was great with child. Mary was pregnant. Mary was expecting. I find that last one really interesting in light of the circumstances that Mary and Joseph found themselves in that first Christmas. They were expecting, but they certainly were not expecting to be expecting. This came out of nowhere, right? This was not their plan. This was totally unexpected. They had no idea this was coming. Life's going one way. They have plans. Uh, Everything seems to be going one way. And then all of a sudden it flips and everything begins going in a different direction. They're engaged. They're preparing to get married. And all of a sudden Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. And then they have to pack up. And go on a long journey to a faraway town because the Caesar has decreed that a census should be taken. So now, not only do they have this unexpected announcement of a baby that's going to be born into this family, a baby who, by the way, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but now they have to go on this trip, a 90 mile trip that they didn't ask for. 
that they didn't plan for, a trip that was required that it be taken by the government, right? You think government has overreached now. Every single one of these people had to go back to the land with which they came to register for this census. So they not only had the unexpected expectation of this baby, they now had to take a trip that they didn't expect, a trip that was required by the government, a trip, by the way, that this young poor couple would have to foot the bill for. Like, that was nothing they were planning on. You want to talk about having plans going one way and all of a sudden having those plans change and flip and going the other way? Not at all what they were planning, nothing that they asked for, not at all what they were expecting. And that's kind of the way life is, isn't it? Life is full of unexpected events. You think things are going to go one way, and all of a sudden they go a different way. Things happen to us we didn't ask for. Life doesn't always go as we expect. Unexpected things happen to us all the time. Which really makes me wonder then, why do we expect things to always go the way we expect them to go when life has shown us that they rarely, if ever, do? Why do we expect life to go the way we expect it to go? When all of us can testify that life has rarely gone the way we thought it would go. And what happens then when life brings you these unexpected twists? And what happens when it is God who initiates these unexpected twists and turns in your life? How do we respond to that? How do we move forward in that? What do we do when God unexpectedly changes our course and gives us directions that we didn't expect or directions that don't seem to make sense or directions that don't seem to fit into our plans? That's exactly the story of Joseph. He finds out his fiance is pregnant. Then he finds out he has to take a trip to Bethlehem. And then one chapter later, as we're going to find out this morning, he is told by God that he now has to take his wife and this newborn baby to Egypt all the way from Bethlehem. But before we get into the trip from Bethlehem to Egypt, I thought it would be important this morning to do a deep dive on Joseph. We covered a little bit of this last week, but I think it's important that we understand who Joseph was as a man so that we understand why he was able to do what he was able to do when God called him and Mary and Jesus to take off to a faraway land, the land of Egypt. Very little is written about Joseph in Scripture. But what we do know about Joseph, the little that is written about him, is very revealing. Uh, we read this last week, but let's review this just for a minute. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. This verse tells us a lot about Joseph. Joseph was a godly man, a righteous man. He was faithful to God, but he was also compassionate to people. And, and this is the heart of Joseph, a man who really wants to please God but a man who also has compassion for people. And Scripture tells us that because she was pregnant, and even though no physical union had taken place between Joseph and Mary, Joseph is now faced with a really difficult decision, one that has a lot of options, none of which are easy. Choice number one, he could get divorced. We talked about this last week, that engagement in Jesus' time in that region is very different than engagement here in our time in America. This was a legally binding thing. Uh, two families would enter into this betrothal, this agreement. So for them to break this engagement, it would have to be some legal proceedings to take place to make it happen, to terminate the engagement. It's basically something similar to a divorce. That would be one of his options. Don't forget that the punishment for adultery in that day and age was stoning. Another option. Choice three, marry her anyway, with all of the complications and all of the issues that would come with that. Joseph has to make one of those decisions, and none of them are easy. Like, these are real people with real-life issues 
dealing with real struggles. They're not just some statues in a nativity set. Like, they're not some characters in a play. Mary and Joseph are dealing with some real, real life issues. And Joseph has to make a decision. And according to Matthew, the decision he makes is to divorce her quietly for her protection. So he's wrestling with, how do I do this? Like, how do I do everything in a God-honoring way and yet still be merciful to Mary? How do I do everything in a God-honoring, God-serving, God-loving way and still live according to his will and his word? How do I live this out faithful to God yet merciful to Mary? How do I steward this situation in the most God-honoring way possible? And as he's struggling with this and working through this and thinking it through, God sends an angel to Joseph and to give him some clarification and to give him some direction. And here's what the angel says. After he considered this, meaning divorcing her quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. Okay, so now Joseph, in case you're keeping track, is on plan C. Plan A was go and marry Mary and just have this normal life, the one that he had envisioned, the one that he thought would unfold. Plan B was to divorce her quietly. Now we're on to plan C. Plan C, get this, God's plan is for him to take Mary as his wife, to to marry this pregnant woman who is carrying a child who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and who will save the people from their sins. That was not in Joseph's plans. Plan C was not one of the plans Joseph had before entering into this. This is a lot to process for Joseph. I got it. What? Like my, My wife's pregnant. How? With who? And you want me to do what? Like, this is a lot for Joseph to comprehend. So what does he do? I mean, in the midst of all this confusion, in the midst of this life getting totally flipped upside down, in the midst of all of this news and unexpected information that he gets, what does he do? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, and he gave him the name Jesus. What did he do? He did what God called him to do, even though he didn't get it, even though it made no sense, even though it wasn't part of his plans. I'm not sure how much sense this made to him. I don't think he knew at all what this would mean for him. I don't think he knew what it would mean for Mary. I don't think he knew what it would mean for Jesus, but he still went and did what God called him to do. If I'm Joseph in that moment, I'm like, I I don't get it. Like, I don't know what all this means. It seems like it's going nowhere. This whole thing seems very chaotic. But as we learned last week, the difference between Zechariah and the difference between Joseph, one was prove it, one was I trust you. And Joseph in the middle of that responds as the way Joseph responds. Like, I I trust you. I don't get it. I'm not sure what it all means. I'm not sure what's going to happen next. I'm not even so sure I like this new arrangement. But God, I trust you. And because I trust you, I'll do it. Sometimes God asks us to do things that just don't always make sense to us. And he asks us in those moments to trust him. Just trust me in it. Now, what's cool about this section of scripture, to me, is that the writer Matthew takes a break from this narrative in the middle of all this to give us a little behind-the-scenes information to help us understand what's really going on. Because again, to Joseph, this just looks like a bunch of chaos. It looks like it makes no sense at all. But, but behind the scenes, Matthew gives us some information that I am sure Joseph would have loved to have in this moment. Matthew says this, all of this took place, this whole deal, right? The, the, the census and the the back and forth and the virgin and, and the, the, the child being conceived by the Holy Spirit, like all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Like God knows what he's doing. It's behind the scenes 
Joseph can't see any of this. This has been going on for centuries. God's plan. This was, this was prophesied hundreds of years before it happened. It's also, it's, it comes obvious to us, the reader of Matthew, we're like, oh, all this took place to fulfill what God had said would happen. But, but Joseph can't see any of this. Joseph doesn't know any of this. But God's plan has been in place since the beginning of time. A plan that the prophet Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before. That a virgin would give birth to a son. And all of this was taking place to fulfill that plan. To what degree Joseph was aware of that plan? I don't know. But I'm pretty sure he had no idea the part, the significant part, he was going to play in the unfolding of that plan. At this point, he doesn't know much. Here's what he knows. I have a fiancé. My fiancé's pregnant. She's pregnant with a child that has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. I am to name him Jesus, and he will save the people from their sins. That's all he has to go on. But apparently it's enough. Because Scripture says he went and did exactly what God called him to do. Without all the answers, without all the guarantees, amidst all the uncertainty, amidst all the unknowns, he just did what God asked him to do. He put his faith in God. The evidence of that faith, the evidence of that trust is in his actions. See, the evidence of your faith in God The evidence of your trust in God is in your actions. The evidence of your faith in God, the evidence of your faith, the evidence of your trust is in your obedience. It becomes very clear by the way Joseph lives his life that he has tremendous faith and trust in God. Because the evidence of our faith and the evidence of our trust is in our actions. The evidence of our faith, the evidence in our tr- of our trust is in our obedience. It's easy to say you have faith. It's different to actually act in faith. It's easy to say you have faith. It's harder to actually walk in that faith. It's hard to take that step, especially when you don't know the whole plan. Like you don't know the whole story. You don't know what he's doing behind the scenes. That's where faith and trust come into play. To take that first step of obedience, especially when you don't see the logic in any of it. So it then shouldn't surprise us one chapter later, when God gives Joseph another kind of bizarre command, an unexpected direction, that Joseph responds the way he does. Because this is a pattern of the way Joseph lives his life, with trust and faith. When God calls Joseph to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt, it's not like all in that moment, like he just mustered up the self-will to do that. Like this is a pattern of the way that this man lived. We'll get to this more a little next week, but when the wise men show up on the scene, it sets off a chain of events that has the king wanting to kill the baby Jesus. That sounds bizarre, but but the arrival of the wise men sets off a chain of events where the king actually wants to murder Jesus. Like, how's that for a family-friendly Christmas story? Yeah, Jesus is born, hallelujah, and the king wants to murder him. The king wants to put him to death. That sounds more like internet clickbait than it does like a family Christmas story. Like, unwed teenage virgin gives birth to baby. How can this be? The reason why this king wants to murder a baby will shock you. With one royal decree, hundreds of babies die. Click here and find out why. This sounds more like internet clickbait than it does like a family Christmas story. Somebody wants to murder the baby. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. you got to understand, the Son of God has come to earth. The battle is on. The Prince of Peace has come. The kingdom of God is breaking through. The love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God have literally come to life here in this Jesus. The prince of peace has come and a spiritual battle is underway. One thing we learn through the scriptures is this. The presence of Jesus always stirs things up. And Jesus is here and let me tell you, he has arrived and the battle has begun. There is a spiritual war that begins to happen in that moment. 
And it's in that moment that Joseph gets another angelic visitation. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. To which, if I'm Joseph at this point, I'm thinking, what? I just took my pregnant wife all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now you're telling me that we have to go where? If I'm Joseph, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. This is not part of the plan. i got to go where? How am I going to get there? Where am I going to live when I get there? How am I going to earn a living there? How long will I have to stay there? He doesn't get any of that information. All God says to him is go to Egypt and stay there till I tell you otherwise. It kind of reminds me, you remember when God called Abraham, Abram? He says, go to the land I will show you. Can you get a more vague command than that? Go to the land I'll show you. Doesn't tell him where it is. Doesn't tell him how he's going to get there. Doesn't tell him how long it's going to take. Doesn't give him any of the plans, any of how this thing's going to unfold. He doesn't even give him the destination. No explanation, no timetable. All he gives Abraham is go. Go to the land, I'll show you. And apparently for Abraham, a man of faith, that was enough. Because we're told Abraham then got up and went. And all Joseph has in this moment is go to Egypt until I tell you to come back. I would want a more detailed itinerary than that. I'd want the brochure. I'd want the outline. I'd want someone to print me the triptychs and say, like, this is how this is all going to unfold. Give me something. But God did give him something. He gave him a task and asked him to do it. See, God doesn't always supply all the details we might want. God doesn't always supply all the reasons we might want. Because he wants us to grow in this thing called faith. He wants us to grow in this thing called trust. And with very little to go on, and perhaps a whole lot of fear, we read this. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. He did exactly what God called him to do. No hesitation. That night, up, gone. What would you have done? Wait for some more assurances? Wait for some more answers. Wait for some more details. Joseph just gets up and goes. You want to talk about a major inconvenience. First, he takes his pregnant fiance on a 90-mile trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now he's going to take him on a 400-mile trip from Bethlehem to Egypt with 24 hours notice. Like, do you know how hard it would be to plan that kind of a trip? You guys who have children have traveled with children, you know, right? Where are we going to put the playpen? Where are we going to put the pack and play? Where are we going to put the teething rings? Like, they, they had no time to plan this at all. It says he got up and he went. Think of all the unknowns. Think of all the planning that you would want to do to make this trip. But what I love about this section of Scripture, and this is the second time we see this this morning, is again, Matthew takes a step back. And he gives us a little behind-the-scenes information. He wants, us, he wants us to know once again that God is at work behind the scenes. What just seems like chaos and utter ridiculousness that the king wants to kill babies. Like what just seems like something that's gotten so out of control. We see God, God is still in control. And Matthew lets us know this again in verse 15. Because it says this. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so... As a result of this, so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I have called my son. See, the prophet Hosea, hundreds of years, 700 years before this, gave this prophecy. And when Hosea gave this prophecy, it was one of those prophecies that points forward and it points backwards at the same time. When he, when he, it's pointing backwards to a time when God showed his intense love for Israel by calling them up out of Egypt. Israel, his, his son, like his people, his nation, he called them up 
out of Egypt. Hosea, when, when Hosea prophesies this, it's pointing back to the time where God led the people up out of Egypt, his son up out of Egypt. But it was also pointing forward to a time when God would once again call his son out of Egypt, his greater son, God doing a greater thing when he brings Jesus up out of Egypt. The prophecy was looking forward and backward at the same time. The original exodus then, when God took the Israelites up out of Egypt toward freedom, was a picture of what God was going to do later when he brings his son Jesus up out of Egypt to bring us all freedom. And for the second time now this morning, if you're counting, an Old Testament prophecy has been fulfilled. And in that, it was fulfilled as Joseph submitted himself to God's plan. And once again, it's Joseph's obedience, his faith and his trust expressing itself as action. His faith and his trust expressing itself in obedience. It plays a huge role in God's story. And Joseph has no idea. If we could just drop an interviewer down here with a microphone at this point and ask Joseph, hey, what's going on? He'd say, I don't know. I mean, this is utter chaos. This makes absolutely no sense. All he can see is what he can see. And he has no idea the ramifications of everything. He has no idea of what God is doing behind the scenes and has been doing behind the scenes for centuries. But being a righteous man, being a just man, being a God-fearing man, being a God-loving man, being a God-serving man, he just does what God asks him to do anyway. He takes Mary home, takes her as his wife. When the child comes into the world, he names him Jesus. And then when God says, take him to Egypt, he takes him to Egypt with no plan at all, just doing whatever God asked him to do. Could it really be that simple? That in the midst of all the unexpected twists and turns in your life, that with all of the unknowns and unforeseen circumstances that come our way, in the midst of all of the confusion and all of the questions and all of the surprises and all of the twists and all of the turns and all of the feeling dis disoriented and uncomfortable, not having all the answers, not understanding why, not understanding what all of it means, that all God is asking you to do in the middle of that is to just do what he's asked you to do. The cool part about this is you don't need the answers to do this. You don't need to understand the whole backstory to do this. You don't need to understand all the reasons and all the rationale to do this. You don't need all the answers to do this. It's just a trust thing. And all Joseph does throughout this entire episode is just do the most God-honoring, God-loving, God-serving, obedient thing. All he does through this entire episode is just do everything in the most God-honoring, God-loving, God-serving, obedient way possible. You can do that even when you don't have all the answers. You can do that even when things don't seem to make sense. You can do that when everything you thought was going to go one way flips and begins to go the other way. You can do that even when everything in your world is changing. And you can do that because God proved once and for all in Christ Jesus that he is not just for us, but that he is with us and that he is at work behind the scenes even when you can't see it. He is at work behind the scenes in a way that you can't possibly dream or imagine. Even when to you it just looks like, man, this just looks like chaos. There's no plan here. This makes no sense. And, and if I do see a plan, the plan itself doesn't make sense. God is at work. Your role in this is just to do everything in the most God-honoring, God-loving, God-serving, obedient way possible. And you can do that even when you don't have all of the answers. Here's the truth. You have no idea what your acts of obedience are doing. You really have no idea what your acts of obedience can do. You have no idea what lives God will touch through your obedience. You have no idea in what ways God will touch lives 
through your obedience. Be honest, you have no idea how your obedience fits into God's bigger picture. Joseph didn't. You have no idea how your small acts of obedience or your large acts of obedience play a significant role in the plan of God in your life and in the lives of those around you. You have no idea what might be accomplished in those acts and through those acts. But here's one thing we do know. Those acts always bring pleasure to God. Those acts always bring glory to God. Those acts always build up faith and trust in God. And God can do great things in them and through them. Just ask Jesus' earthly daddy. Just ask Joseph. Let's pray. Father, help us not to base our obedience on what we can see and what we know, what we understand and what we don't understand. But help us to put our faith and trust in you. And that that faith and trust might show itself by the way that we act, by the way that we live. God, would you help us in whatever situation we find ourselves in? All of us right now are in situations we expected. We're all in ex situations that we didn't expect. But in each and every situation, God, we pray this morning that you would help us to just do everything in the most God-loving, God-honoring, God-serving way possible. We can do that, Father, without all the answers. We can do that because of the gift you've gave us in Christ Jesus that we can say, I have a God that I can trust. A God who has met my every need in Christ. So God, for those of us wrestling with what the next thing to do is or how to play this out or the decisions we need to make, as Joseph wrestled with all the possible permutations of all the decisions he could have made, God, help us to do what Joseph did. To want to live faithfully to you and mercifully to others. That you might receive glory, that you might receive pleasure, that you might receive honor. God, we pray that we would do all of these things in the power that is given to us by the Holy Spirit, in the blood of Jesus shed for us. We pray this in your Son's mighty and precious and powerful name. Amen. One of my fears with this sermon is that everyone walks out of here thinking Joseph was the hero of the story. Joseph's not the hero of this story. God is the hero of the story. God is always the hero of this story. God used a census and a decree and government and Caesars and kings and a poor couple to bring forth his will. All Joseph did was submit himself to the hero's plan. And that's all God is asking you to do, to just submit yourself to the will of the Father. You can make your plans, but let God direct your steps. The writer of Proverbs puts it this way in Proverbs 16, 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. As you plan your course, would you allow your heavenly Father to direct your steps? and walk in accordance to what he's called you to do. You have no idea what God will do in and through your acts of obedience. So walk in faith and trust. And would you continue to ponder this wonderful holiday season and join us again next week as we continue to celebrate a merry little Christmas together. Thanks for being here. Amen.